My name's Dave DeBow, founder of MoneyPartnerFormula.com, and this show is built for everyday real estate investors who are actively doing deals and looking to scale using other people's money. So if you're an active real estate investor and you want to get featured on this show to talk about your own real estate and capital raising experiences, then just go to DaveInterviewsYou.com. Now let's get rolling with this episode and remember to subscribe for daily interview content. All right, guys, welcome to Property Profits Podcast. I'm your host, Bryce Kaminsky, filling in for Dave Dubow. And have you ever wondered how someone can own an apartment building at just 22 years old? Well, today, my guest, Adam Vincent Morrow, Morneau, ah, we're going to get the right one from him in a second, from Massachusetts and Indiana. He's living out in LA, living the dream, is going to help us kind of unravel how he was not only able to achieve this remarkable feat, but also closing back-to-back -back deals on multi-unit properties. Adam, welcome to the show, man. Great to have you here. Yeah, it's great to be here, Bryce. Thank you. So the my question is like, multifamily isn't an obvious starting position. People want to get into it. Usually five years in, 10 years in, they get tired of the single family rentals or whatever. And they decide, oh, I guess I'm going to get into more doors because they want like they're compressed. They want to compress their doors together. Um, what what inspired you to get into real estate investing at such a young age? You know, you could I bet there's lots of people your age who are still like. Uh, partying all night, waking up in the afternoon and working at uh, the burger place down the street. Why? Yeah. Why real estate? Why 22? What's driving you? So back in, in high school, I, um, I always say it's because I got to grow up with the internet and I kind of use it as a tool more so. So I was always studying about, um, like finances and th ways to improve myself. And I stumbled upon real estate and I mean, like the story goes, I fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. I originally had the plan that, um, I mean, I bounced between a few strategies when I was researching in high school. And right. then I originally had this plan that I wanted to house hack and start, you know, my investing portfolio. So um, basically, huge, right. You know, especially when you're yeah. young, because you're like, how am I going to pay my rent? Well, it wouldn't yeah. be nice if somebody paid it for me. So you started looking into house hacking, then what? Yeah, then uh, so. When I got out of high school, I decided I didn't want to go to college and mm. I wanted to pursue real estate and be an entrepreneur in every way I could. So I started saving money to buy that house. And when the time came, I got like a real estate agent. I started looking for houses and stuff like that. I stumbled upon syndications and an education company for syndications. Mm -hmm. And um, Essentially, I rerouted. And instead of buying a house, I invested my money into education to learn how to buy bigger apartment buildings instead of buying a, a smaller multifamily. Yeah, because you look at it and it's like, and I would always say that when we were doing the education stuff with the seminar circuit and things like that, I'd say, look, you know, you got 20 grand, you can buy a rental or you can invest in yourself and learn how to use other people's money and scale infinitely because there's no shortage of capital but there's a shortage of ideas in this world and so if you can be the one who brings ideas to the table uh the capital will line up so what was your first uh you know step in transitioning from learning about real estate to actively investing in it oh it was a long journey um it was honestly for me it was just learning so much to where I felt comfortable to a point where I just felt like the next step, I I just need to take action or whatever that was. Mm. And so for me, initially it was forming a team with other investors, experienced right. investors and um, learning about, you know, asset management, um, underwriting. I, I learned to, I spent months learning how to underwrite to find a good deal. Be found um, I spent a lot of time doing that too. What's up? On multifamily, you got to spend a lot of time doing underwriting because there's so many more pieces. This isn't just one house. This is like, like you're saying, 60 houses kind of stacked together. So when when you got past all of the underwriting, at what point did you say, um, you know, I've kind of learned everything that I need to learn. 
and it's time to like start making offers. What was the moment where you said I'm ready? It was a few months. It was like back in the beginning of this year, uh, mm-hmm. 2024. And my coach who uh, the education company I invested in, she said, the more offers you submit, the more likely you are to get a deal. And that's mm-hmm. the whole reason why you're doing this. You don't want to be on the sidelines. You know what I mean? So yeah. that just changed something in my head. And I just said, okay, like the first deal that came after that, 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 uh, you know, underwrote well, we submitted our LOI and then a few more after that. And then we got one accepted. Yeah. What's, what's interesting about that is there's a lot of people who kind of sit on their hands when it comes to offers. They're like, ah, they're asking too much and they don't make an offer. And the reality is that they can ask whatever they want, but what they'll take is unknown. Their reaction to the offer is really what makes a deal or not. I've seen people on a single family house come down, you know, $40,000 on a 149 down to 99 because I offered them 91 and finding that you were not, you're not going to find that price, the real, what they'll take until you make the offer. So when you, you know, looked at that 64 unit, how did you find and secure that opportunity? So it was through, uh, well, really networking and partnering with experienced people. I, um, ended up partnering with a sponsor who's heavily invested in that market and he has great connections directly to sellers. So he brought it to our team and said, Hey, let's underwrite this and see how it goes and ended up working really well at the beginning. And then because of his relationship with the sellers as well, we got a better price on acquisition and worked out like great terms that, you know, really made the deal amazing. So, so did you get a vendor financing, some take backs, or did you have to bring all cash to the table there? No, it's uh. so we got a recourse loan. So the sponsor is guaranteeing it, but the seller, there's a, an agreement between us and the seller that they can only deliver it to us 95% occupied. Um, we ended up getting it 40 K a door under market, which is mm. already like a great yeah. deal. And then we got our property management in place before we've officially taken over. So our business plan is already being ex- executed before we've officially closed on the deal, which when you're doing multifamily value add, the quicker you can stabilize it, you know, mm-hmm. obviously the better. So, yeah. So what were the biggest challenges that you had to face uh, during that first deal? How'd you overcome them? Oh, that's a great question. First challenge is definitely nerves. I mean, like they always say the first one's the hardest and it's definitely true. Cause it's like when, when you actually decide to take action, that's like designing, deciding to climb like a big mountain, I guess, you know, like what was the offer price? Offer price 6.4. Well, right. I remember writing my first offer for like 99 K and my, and my heart was like, <laughs> beating out of my chest it's like oh 99 grand what am I gonna do you know if they say yes and you're over here writing six point something million dollars so (laughs) I'm sure that's a little bit nerve-wracking as well um how did you overcome the sticker price and the, the the dealings of that thing like how do you keep that perspective like in the business of multifamily 6.4 is that's a, like a great, that's like, uh, let's say it's 64 units, 100K a door. Um, depends on the market. You know, some t- markets you can buy lower and higher and condition, but that's still um, a big amount of capital. Did you have the capital lined up coming in or did you have to figure it out after? Yeah. So we, um, like when it comes to the EMD and stuff, the sponsors secured that and because it's a recourse loan, obviously they secured the loan when it comes to like acquisition and closing from the time that I got like started the education and invested into it. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, they really hammered into us that obviously don't do a deal unless it's a good one, but the whole point of syndications is to partner with passive investors. So I started networking as soon as I, as I started and I built that list up as much as I could. Um, as well as my team members to where we felt comfortable that we could, 
raise that amount, especially because it's a good deal, you know, so that, that definitely helped. Yeah. But, have yeah. you, have you ever been there? Have you ever been to the apartment? You know, what's so funny is all of my team's been there, but since I just moved like two months ago from Massachusetts to California, it's like I moved across country and now I have a deal back home because the deal's in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So I haven't been there yet. Hoping to go within the next like month or so. Yeah. So now that you got that first one under your one under your belt, you start looking for the second one. So how did you manage to secure the second one so quickly after your first? Were you working on both of these at the same time? Or what sort of method or strategy did you employ that had you kind of hitting deal after deal like that? I think it definitely comes down to building good relationships. Um, Cause like what I mentioned with the seller before, it turned out that we were such a, a good team to work with that he told us that he's um, dissolving his prof or, uh, portfolio and yeah. he wants to work with us on his next building. And we told him like, I mean, we'd love to, we can only do one at a time though. So if you're willing to, um, like delay that a few weeks to let us close this, then we'll happy to, we'll be happy, you know, to, yeah. to buy that from you. Right. Yeah. So what lessons did you learn in the first closing that you applied to your second closing there? Oh, good question. Um, what applied? Hmm. I would definitely say, uh, Capital raising never ends, I oh, guess, yeah. because. <laughs> yeah, right. Like if you think yeah. about big business too, you think about, you think about like Coca-Cola, you think about big businesses, you know, that have to buy product to make product to sell product They're They have capital investments. Like look at all of Silicon Valley. Like they're, they take in millions and potentially a billion dollars and they haven't even made anything yet. So yeah. like the capital and the idea never ends. You know, the the number of ideas you can bring to the table really is the difference on how much money you're making. Because you can raise money all day, but if it's not deployed, it's not making you any money. So syndication is obviously the direction you have to go when you're talking about 6.4, 10.5, 20.6, 100, 200 million dollars these deals keep going, the product gets better. You know, I'm sure you're looking at real estate out there going, I can't believe people pay these prices for these houses when I can go back to Massachusetts and buy an entire neighborhood for what one of these <laughs> properties here in California is selling for. But can you explain what syndication is to the people listening at home and why you chose that strategy versus finding like a couple of big, big players to put the deal together? Yeah, absolutely. So syndications is when you partner um, with a group of investors to buy bigger properties. So in our case, it, it, we have a general partners, which is me yeah. and my partners. We actively work on the investment and run it and everything. And then we have limited partners who are passive investors. And those are people who um, maybe they have a high paying job, they enjoy their job and they want to get into real estate, but they don't want to spend the time, you know, managing it or doing everything. So they can passively invest with us. Um, we can buy bigger properties and we all get the returns. I chose so, syndications. Oh, no, go ahead. Syndications. Uh, important. Yes. I chose syndications because when I was going to buy the house hack originally, I, I quickly knew that it was going to be like growing my portfolio that way was going to be limited to my own capital. Mm -hmm. And as an 18 year old fresh out of high school, obviously I didn't have you got that, nothing, right? <laughs> yeah. So I, I knew I wanted to do real estate full time. I knew I wanted to be an investor and coming across syndications. It was kind of like a, a flip the switch moment. Like I knew, I knew that's what I wanted to do. So when you look at, here, here's here's a challenge because like before, obviously I'm now 40 and I have a few more white hairs from being in real estate. When I started, um, I had like the kind of Justin Bieber swoop and my face was all shaven and people gave me a hard time because I was only 30. Um, being only 22, do you find that 
you're having to prove yourself in that respect more than if you were 55 like would people oh yeah you to be doing what you're doing if you looked older or actually were yeah for sure i like when i'm networking and stuff the the most common thing i get as soon as i enter a conversation is how old are you you look so are young you a realtor? like yeah yeah That's seriously who you usually right 22 <laughs> become a realtor drive a lexus leased right <laughs> yeah exactly um, so, I mean, right off the bat, they know that I don't have years of experience cause I can't cause I'm 22. Um, so I do feel like I have to go the extra step to prove that I, you know, work hard as everyone else. I'm the way I see it is that the money that I invested into my education company for investing would have been my college tuition. So I have a college degree in real estate investing is how I like to see it, you know? Yeah. So um yeah i definitely do think that's true but at the same time if if it's going to be that much of a problem um uh, with people then those aren't the people i want to work with anyway you know so yeah you know. yeah right if they can't get on board then they can find someone else to do business with now you mentioned social media is a challenge for you um how are you working to overcome and leverage this for your business yeah it's it's funny because I grew up with social media, but I think it's just because I, I grew up with social media in a personal way mm. and having to flip that switch and now seeing it in a marketing way is, has been a challenge. Uh, but really it's just like most other things. I'm just forcing myself to do it and forcing myself to produce content like educational content mm -hmm. um, and, and learning as I go. So. Well, it's interesting too, because you look at it and you say, okay, I know what my feed looks like. Um, it's a bunch of people, a bunch of dudes in their like 30s and 40s uh, doing real estate. I bet you you go on your Instagram and it's just a bunch of 22 year olds like jumping off of sheds into pools and stuff. Like, <laughs> how do you, how do you, how do you, frame that up what is what are your peers saying to you when you're like here's me in front of my 64 unit building like what are they saying what what kind of reaction are you getting when you start posting this stuff uh it's been different for everyone I think most people are just confused about what I'm doing one of my closest friends when I first started doing it she thought I was in like a pyramid scheme or something yeah well, <laughs> so, let's, let's be real syndication has got a <laughs> touch of pyramid scheme in there but it's yeah. probably that, that's why securities has it as a, a classed item and you have to go through the broker brokers and stuff like that because it does have a touch of like give me your money and i'll make more out of it and you just don't have to do anything it sounds very very pyramid but no. for people listening at home syndication is not a pyramid scheme <laughs> it is a investment tool for multifamily product and commercial, I guess you could buy industrial. It's just big, big ticket things, you know, 10 million, 5 million, even a couple million can be a syndicated deal. If you put a bunch of people at 150, 150, 150. So when you look at your social media and the business tool that you're using it as, um, are you finding that people are unsubscribing? Like, are your people, are your friends going like, this is too serious for me. I just want to like uh, drink, drink beer. I guess in the States, like you're 22, right? So you've only been able to drink for like a year or maybe even six months. I don't know when your birthday is, but yeah. uh, I always found that was weird. You can go to war and die, but you can't have a drink. I don't get it. But, I know, right? Um, do you find there's a little bit of like a backlash because of the difference between your peers I mean, when I came into real estate, I was in the music industry first and there's no, there's like no capital investors in the music business, all the broke musicians, uh, you know, all of a sudden my social media feed started going like this, like it was all new network connections. And yeah, I still have a few like of music connections on my, on my Facebook and stuff like that, but, uh, it doesn't make me any money. I don't, I don't, it's like the past like high school yearbook okay cool look at my dumb haircut from high school right yeah. so when you look at it do you have people unsubscribing from your thing 
you yeah. know, people used to follow and now they're like, I'm not interested in his real estate journey. Yeah, for sure. I, I've had a few people like that, but I also would say that I'm, um, separating myself from those people as well. Like when I chose that, I wanted to go that entrepreneur route and self-improvement route. If, if there were people in my life that were trying to bring me down, I separated myself because I knew that was going to happen anyway. So definitely both of those two things have, have happened in the past year or two. So what advice would you give young or new investors who are stuck in that analysis paralysis stage? Yeah, it's definitely tough because I mean, I'm, I'm still just beginning, but when you look at like the, the most successful people after all the journeys they've gone through and things they've climbed, they always say that beginning is the hardest. Mm -hmm. Um, but my biggest thing that I have to just keep telling myself is just keep coming back, I guess, like, uh, never give up, you know, never surrender. Yeah, exactly. Like there might be oh. people in your life who, who don't agree with what you're doing, who think it's a fraud or don't think you can be successful, try to bring you down. And you may go through times where you start to believe them, but if you just keep coming back, um, you know, yeah. eventually you'll make some progress. Well, the, the other thing too is like, I had this other guy talking to me the other earlier today and he's like, I'm 21 and my life is like falling off the rails and stuff. And I'm like, man, I didn't even know what I wanted to do or or had any idea of direction until I was 27. So I was like, just do things. You can fail every year for the next eight years and still be right where I started at 30, which is like zero. So you might as well swing for the fences because you'll never have as much energy as you do today. Um, it just goes down. Unfortunately, I'm here to tell you that the energy level, Adam, goes down from here on out. So um, when it comes to people investing with you, how do you give them that security? You know, what sort of, obviously it's a secure fund because it is, uh, I believe we were talking 506B, right? So this is a secured fund, but how do you maintain that transparency for your investors? You know, what sort of things are you doing at the fund to make sure that people are informed, engaged and secured? Yeah, for sure. I, I think it goes like all the way from the beginning and the reason I started this company and the name of my company is Kefi Capital, which Kefi means the spirit of joy. And the whole, like my whole thing is helping people find their Kefi through financial freedom. So like I have a whole motto and reasoning behind why I do what I do. And I think it starts there, but when it actually comes to investing in a deal, definitely transparency, um, honesty and everything we do like if i mean there's no guaranteed safeness in an investment so if things start to like get rumbly and tumbly whatever uh we make sure to communicate that as it's happening so that investors are aware right and what our plans are going to be for how we're going to get ourselves out of that mm -hmm. um but ju definitely just communication is the best thing a, a solid plan how we're going to execute what we plan to execute and answer any questions they have. Um, awesome. So if people want to connect with you, they want to find out more, uh, what should they do? How do they find you? Uh, social media, LinkedIn, it's Adam V. Morneau. Uh, it's last name's M-O-R-N-E-A-U. Uh, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook. Um, I don't have a YouTube yet. I might, we'll see. But definitely those three things. You can also check out my websites, Kefi Capital, K E F I Capital.com. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you stopping by and letting us know that uh, even you young guns out there at 20 are out here doing the hard work. And yeah, you hold you, you know, put a stack of those together. You might be uh you might be out of the game by 30. You might never even have to play after 30. Who knows? We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all the all the luck to you. Not that you need it. All the underwriting to you, and then you keep <laughs> going and get it done. 
Uh, until next time, guys, we'll catch you on the next episode. Hey there, I really hope you enjoyed that episode. And as always, if you want to listen to more daily interview content, make sure you subscribe. And if you're an active real estate investor and you're doing deals and you'd like to get featured on this show, then just head over to DaveInterviewsYou.com. Now at MoneyPartnerFormula.com, we help real estate investors to create a process for predictably getting capital so they can do more deals without relying on hard money lenders or the banks. We do this by building them a private capital marketing system. Now, if you want help turning yourself into a big money capital attraction machine, then book a call with our team to see how we can help. Just visit moneypartnerformula.com to find out more. All right, take care and we'll see you on the next interview.